Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the president of RMY Construction and the owner of the very popular Izakaya Nonbe restaurant. He is Russell Yamamoto, and today we are going beyond construction. Hey, Russell, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Hey, thank you for having me, Rusty. Now, Russell, I know that you graduated from Iolani School and, and now you're on the board of Iolani, but can you tell me what were some of the highlights uh, when you attended Iolani School? Yeah, yeah, there's a number of them. Um, when I was going there, it was an all boys school, so much different than what it is today. But for me, I, I think the high point was playing for coach Eddie Hamara and learning the one team concept uh, over the years. Um, he was one of my more important mentors growing up uh, in high school. So yeah, I, I definitely, uh, Coach Eddie uh, played a huge part in my life. So Russell, what was the biggest thing you learned from Coach Eddie? Oh, everything was assignment. Everything was, was based on assignment. Do your job, um, going back. I, you know, we were playing, I think it was Kalani. And, you know, when you have, when there's a running play and I was a defensive end and my job was to maintain my corner. But, you know, like, uh, you know, like I didn't do my job and I chased the play because I thought I could make the play, but it was, it turned out to be a reverse. And so a guy came around me and, uh, you know, coach pulled me out of that, the very next play grabbed me by my uh, nose guard and said, hey, what about the assignment? And looked straight at me, I'm like, oh God, you know, because it ended up being a touchdown. So anyway, you know, it's things like that. And, and, and also that, uh, you know, the one team concept, which carries on to this day at Ilani School, but, you know, coach uh, Ed was the one that instilled it. And there are a lot of examples of that. You know, uh, my teammate uh, had a girlfriend that brought him a, a can of juice after a game. And he looked at him and said, hey, you know, um, is there enough for everybody? And so the kid threw the juice away. And same thing with Lays. You know, guys, girls' friends would bring Lays to their, their boyfriend players. And he looked at them and said, hey, you got enough for everybody? And, you know, so that's how coach was. Yeah, he was very honest. He was very fair. And it was always everyone is included. Yeah. I, so, I like hearing that. And that's why he was very successful, too. And, and oh, absolutely. Yeah. And Russell, you have two very successful businesses. But I want to ask you if you can first tell me about RMY Construction. Okay, RMY um, it's it's kind of a long story, but I think it was probably in my eyesight from when I was very young. You know, growing up, I, I lived on a farm, four years old, I'm running a farm tractor. And then during my summers, you know, working in a construction field, you know, to earn a living for the following year, right? Um, anyway, RMY eventually evolved um, in 1986 after an unsuccessful um, partnership uh, with another company. And you probably heard of it. It's called Mega Construction. It's, uh, I started that in 1984. But uh, again, we split up and, um, you know, different philosophies, of course. But RMY uh, Construction now has been in business in 1986 to current. Um, we do a lot of heavy construction work, which, which we call in the industry site work. And we, we really specialize in sewer, uh, water systems, drainage systems, parking lots, a lot of concrete work, and occasionally a subdivision. If it comes by, we'll do it. We can, we're capable of doing it. Um, we um, have about 27 employees that are the core group. 
and we, you know, we hire as necessary. Uh, got about maybe 40 pieces of heavy equipment. And um, yeah, we're, we, you know, we're, we're, we've grown since, the, since 1984. And uh, if I take you back to those days, um, we couldn't, you know, we didn't have any bonding and bonding is the bloodline of any construction company. And so in order to get that, you know, um, you know, my wife, Patricia, she and I would go, we, we drive down to Pearl Harbor and Hickam Air Force Base. And we go through the bins there and look for jobs to bid under $25,000. Because under $25,000, there was no, re no bond requirement. So we'd pick up a bunch of them and I'd bid them and we'd get them and I'd go out and actually do the project with two or three guys and create a track record. Eventually create it one positive enough that the bond companies were willing to bond us. But um, obviously me having to personally indemnify them. But we've since grown um, that now RMI stands alone and we don't have to personally indemnify. But that, you know, that comes with trust, you know, and experience. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where RMY is today. Now, Russell, I know that, you know, what you guys do really affects all of us because you guys do a lot of infra infrastructure as well. But can you tell me um, what one of your most challenging projects in recent years has been? Oh, this is a number of them. I, I think the most recent, the most recent would be, uh, you know, the Kapilani uh, and the Mo'ili Ili water system projects. Uh, those projects, you know, uh, like the Kapilani one started from Kali Street all the way to Kamoku. And you, and you, you know how busy Kapilani Boulevard is. So we had to install a 12 inch water main along that, that whole route. Um, and as, as we were laying it, you know, there were obstructions, you know, drain, drainage pipes, uh, electrical. And so we were underwater, you know, a large portion of the time. But the hardest part was, you know, we had to go under this huge concrete box culvert on University Avenue, which was down about, you know, minus five below sea level. And um, we had to, we had to um, bring in specialists and help them. Uh, with this technology called directional drilling. So what it is, is they had to drill under the culvert. Uh, and then when they got through drilling, they would pull back that 12 inch, you know, water main under it. And this like about 200 feet long. So that was a challenge. And then of course the more Ili Ili one, uh, we had to go under the same culvert, but more down by the, the Alawai park. And, and we're down like, 18 feet below the road level. And so we had hired some guys in to what they call jet grout. And what, what it is, they shoot concrete, you know, high, high pressure concrete into the soil to solidify it, and then go down and dig it down and tunnel under under and lay the pipe, you know. So so those, you know, those two, the most recent, which is, you know, I'm talking about the last two, three years, you know, year and a half, uh, were very, very challenging. But um, for, for me, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, the one in downtown uh, King Street and that um, entailed everything. I mean, it entailed sewer systems, water systems, gas company, telephone, you know, you name it. Everything that could possibly go underground um, was involved on that project. And it started from River Street to Bethel. And, um, you got to imagine that that's where Polo Harbor originated. So all the things that were there were there in excess of any between 75 to 125 years. And, um, you know, I think, you know, my man at first, when they saw some of the manuals, they, 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 they didn't understand what was, what was written on it. It was, you know, it's cast iron manuals. And it said, um, Honolulu, it didn't say Honolulu, Hawaii, it was Honolulu TH, which was the territory of Hawaii. So that's prior, that's, that's pre-statehood. Yeah, so, you know, um, I explained to him, I said, you know, this is what this means. And like, they're like, oh, wow, that's a long time ago, boss. You know, and it, it, it was, you know, and um, I said, but, you know, you got to appreciate what those guys, that generation had to go through to install all this stuff, 
without the kind of equipment and technology that we have today. You know, so, you know, as we went through the project, um, they learned a lot. We all learned a lot. We, we discovered how to do things differently because, you know, there were a lot of unanticipated, um, you know, issues that came up throughout the project. But in the end, the, the most important thing was to rehabilitate the roadway and beautify Chinatown because back then Chinatown was really, really in uh, bad shape and, and it was dirty. And, uh, but you look at it today, you know, it's got a new pavement section, new sidewalks, paver tiles. And I'm sure the community is a lot happier now than they were before. But for me, I take a lot of pride in that project. Um, my son uh, actually ran that project. And, um, you know, every day we, we, we actually discuss what's going on. And we a lot of times get into arguments about, you know, what's going to happen. But that's natural in, in this business. Um, but at the end, uh, you know, I told him, I said, hey, you know, you, if you stand here at River Street and look down King Street, don't you feel, you know, that this was a good job? He said, yeah, you know, it, it was a good job. We didn't make a whole heck of a lot of money on it, but it was just a satisfaction of um, seeing something that difficult get completed and um, upgrade and, and, and really enhance a part of Honolulu that was really in bad shape. Yeah, so well, that, that's... Russell, you know what I find amazing is, you know, the public, you know, they really don't see all of these things that you just explained. I mean, so many things that you do are yeah. underground. And, yeah. but again, like I said earlier, it affects all of us. And, and I know that you were also the general contractor for Kahawiki Village. Now, why is that project so special to you? Oh, that, that, that's a special one. Um, Dwayne Carriso, he's a huge philanthropist, uh, really nice guy. Came by my office and said, hey, you know, show me a, a, a brief drawing, you know, a simple drawing. He said, what do you think, you know? And I said, well, God, I don't know, what do you want to do? He said, well, we, I want to build this, you know, can we build this? I said, well, yeah, sure, we can build it, but, you know, everybody's got to be on board, you know, so... You know, so we had a meeting and and, and um, we got the right people and, and and Dwayne put together a great team of, um, uh, of, of administrators and contractors. Um, and we met one day at the Pagoda and um, the question came up from the uh, engineers that, you know, uh, we, we need to do a test, uh, test um, pad, but we got to go through the permitting and all that. And, and, and so... <laughs> Uh, we were kind of sitting there wondering what we're going to do. And then, and so I just said, you know what, let's just pour it. I said, yeah, but what if they won't accept it? Well, then we'll, we'll go break it out and remove it. But let's just pour it. You know, we can't just sit here and, and um, you know, mull over what, what can be done. Or let's just do it and apologize for it later if we have to, <laughs> you know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So we went and we did it, and, the, and then Mayor Caldwell came out and he said, yeah, they liked it, and then they started in, uh, in, um, putting up the structure itself, which came from Japan's, um, um, the, the, the re, refurbished um, uh, temporary housing uh, for the, the victims of um, the March 2011 tsunami, yeah? And so um, that's when it got started, and and we we uh, started the fills. We you know we did everything, and, and a lot of it you know our, our team, our whole team did a lot of this work pro bono. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of pro bono work that they all you know were willing to to jump in and provide for you know the, um, for getting people off the streets. Um, you know I, I I'm gonna. I'm gonna plug a, put a plug in for Randy Hiraki at Commercial Plumbing and and Ken Sakurai from from Coastal Construction. Coastal Construction being the largest home building contractor in Hawaii, you know, uh, you know a lot of law for these guys, yeah. And of course our management team, you know, with Dwayne and Lloyd Sueda, Mel Kaneshige, Gordon, you know, um, yeah. And um, we finally got it done. We got it done in record time we, because it was a um, emergency proc proclamation by Governor Ige. We were able to 
take what normally would have taken two, two to maybe three years to accomplish, we got it done in six months. So our first tenants moved in in, um, um, I, I believe it was uh, March, uh, uh, March 12th of 2018. And, um, it, and the biggest satisfaction I had was that morning, the following morning, um, I think, I think it was March 12th, the following morning was March 13th, the infamous uh, mistake siren. Remember, uh, remember that. Anyway, um, I'm. It's it's like maybe six o'clock in the morning, and you know, I, and I I would visit the project every day. I was walking around the project, and if you've ever delivered newspaper when you're a kid, or you're walking in a neighborhood back in the day, and and you 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 know, folks would be, you could smell the bacon frying and the coffee brewing. And I'm walking around Kauhiki and, and I smell this bacon frying and I smell coffee. And it it just it just felt, you know, I wasn't hungry. I just felt so good to know that that there were 30 families, you know, however long they were displaced, now had a roof over their head, cooking their own meal and using having their own toiletries and shower, you know. Um, you know, you, you have to, you have to walk that walk to understand and, and, um, really, uh, enjoy and savor and, 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 and take it all in that feeling of, uh, accomplishment. Yeah. Well, then, Russell, you know, that vision that Dwayne Carisu had for there and, you know, it's, it's you, like you said, it was such a great team effort. Uh, but you, I mean, it is extremely super meaningful for what, you guys all did, and can you can you tell me about how involved you were with the UH football stadium project? Okay, so that's that's a project that started out um, with us replacing the the uh, uh, at the time we we called it Cookfield. It's no longer called Cookfield, but it's Cookfield, the turf that we actually installed a few years earlier. Um, so it was going to be replaced uh, with a new one um, for the football team who had recently been displaced from a law stadium. During that, um, the, uh, you know, right after we started the project, um, you know, this this whole this whole sch uh, the schematic of how they're going to, you know, um, bring in um, spectators, you know, was you know was really un unanticipated. And, um, but you know, the school took it upon themselves and I think they did a wonderful job in, in, in their vision um, and, and trying to get this done. And so um, they, they approached us uh, and asked us if we would um, be willing to, you know, jump in and start some of the work. And because you know all our crews were busy, and this in this particular project, you know, was was a moving target on a daily basis. You know, because okay, we forgot. Oh, we need to do. We need to put this in. We oh, we don't have power to this scoreboard. We don't have power to this spot where the coaches plug in for you know to to watch this video of his players. And it, well, there's a lot of stuff that went on. So I took it. So I decided. You know, this is this is something that. We're not going to have to go through the normal bureaucracy where, you know, uh, my foreman is out there and, and they tell him to do something and then he's got to come back to the office and relay it to me and then we've got to send in a price and then get it approved. Um, we just took, I just said, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to short circuit this whole thing. So I'm going to be out there every day. And if there's any changes, I'll approve it on the, on the spot. So that's what happened, basically. So we got to do. Okay, we'll do it. We'll we'll deal with the money later. We'll just let's get it done. And that's basically how it went. And that's probably the only way it was going to get done. So um, yeah. So I'm I'm proud of that project itself too because it turned out really nice. I I I'm just hoping that um, we can get all the fans and fill up the fill up whatever stands that you know that are there. It's not much, but um, we should fill it up. Yeah. Well, Russell, you know, I mean, it's it's so amazing how much coordination it takes for you guys to really get these big jobs done. And 
I want to ask you about one of my favorite restaurants that you own, Izakaya Nonbe. You know, when you took over ownership of Izakaya Nonbe, um, what were what were what was your biggest goal that you wanted to to strive for? Well, the the, the first goal, the, my priority when we took it over to to be direct, you know, about it was to keep the employees working. Okay. Um, let's, let's go back a few, you know, a few years or whatever. Yeah. And what happened was, you know, um, I, I, I became a restaurant owner by accident. I was actually the landlord. Uh, I had bought the property from the original owner and, and I had no intention of running the restaurant. I, 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 I bought it and I had a, I had a tenant who was actually, um, running the restaurant. Uh, and, uh, he, um, got into some financial difficulty, went back to Japan and and he didn't didn't pay his rent. And um, so, you know, we're dealing with him in Japan from here and uh, it was was very difficult. And uh, meanwhile, you know, I I used to go to that restaurant for, you know, for dinner and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, and I knew the service really well. and so one day, one of the get girls, I said, hey, you know, Mr. Amoro, why don't you um, take over the Russian? I said, hey, you know, I don't, I'm not a Russian guy, you know. Um, but I guess, you know, when, when uh, you know, my, my uh, tenant got pushed against the wall because he really had no money at that point. Um, here we had a, we had a restaurant that was running and it was actually going downhill because he couldn't pay his bills and they weren't delivering product. Um, we went, took it over. We had to actually, we had to go back and pay all those bills in order to get service from the vendors. And, uh, yeah, that, so, you know, um, the whole point was to keep them working and then it, it, it evolved to more than that. You know, today. Um, it is what it is, you know, uh, we, you know, the one thing, there was, there's a few things that I, I firmly believe in, in a restaurant is what, one is you got to be consistent in what you produce. And two, you've got to, or just as important as one, you've got to have a clean sanitary place, you know, where people feel comfortable, you know, I don't see cockroaches running around and, you know, and it's not an old, you don't smell that oily, that oldness in a building, you know? So um, I said, you know what? Uh, we're going to renovate this building. So I said, we're going to, we're going to do, gut it and start over. And uh, we did. And and during that time, you know, we did it. And I think it was uh, we, our last day was July 20, July 1st, 2019. And we rebuilt it and we finished in November. But we kept everybody on payroll because, you know, uh, they're, they're loyal employees and um, kept them on payroll. And then on the, in November, we, we opened up again and we were doing quite well. And, and then three months later, COVID hits us, right? And so we're, we had to pivot, but, but yeah. So, you know, in, in that so-called pivoting period, um, uh, you know, we had, we had to learn to do takeout food. And um, so I had a meeting a couple of weeks before the governor shut the, we shut down the state basically, and um, we decided to um, go out and procure all the takeout, um, you know, the, the plates and the hashis and all that stuff and uh, spoke to the back of the house and the front of the house. And, you know, for the front of the house, it was obviously very hard because, you know, the girls are used to working every night. Now there's, you don't need them because no one's coming in the restaurant. So we figured out a scheduling um, pattern for, for them back of the house, you know, um, obviously they weren't cooking dinner anymore. So they had to make lunch and dinner, you know, but all for takeout. So we revamped the menu at that time as well. So, and of course, you know, we, we had just hired a new manager and he had to walk into this Bobby to walk into this. And I say, Bobby, you know, I, I I wish you luck, man, (laughs) but you got to take the bull by the horn and, uh, but you, you know, we're here to help you. So don't worry. So anyway, you know, getting back to the intent of keeping everybody employed. Well, it, we still have, we have not laid off or fired anyone. We have our same staff that we started with what, eight years ago. And, um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to keep on going.
Well, Russell, I absolutely love it there. And, and Bobby's such a great, great leader of that restaurant. And Russell, you have both of my books. And I want to ask you, what, what stood out to you in the books? You know, that's a really loaded question because there's a lot of stuff in your book that, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I can relate to. And, um, you know, I have some, some, just some quotes that I took some notes down, but these, these little quotes that I, I, we live by. And you had this one thing called, you know, you said little things matter. And, and, you know, I keep telling our guys, hey, you know, you got to fix the little things before you can do the big things, you know, because if you can't handle like picking up a piece of rubbish, you know, that we've left a, or a pep or rock that we, you know, fell out of our trench, you just leave it on the side of the road and somebody hits it and gets hurt, you know, or, or it, you know, it um, damages your automobile, you know, we're in big trouble. So, you know, it's the little things you, do, you start there. And then when you get into the habit of doing it, then, 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 you, you know, then everything starts to work out. Yeah. And then of course your, your quote about, you know, time is lost every second. You know, I keep telling guys that, Hey, you know, um, the sun will rise tomorrow. So no matter if you made a mistake today, you're going to have to face up to it tomorrow. You know, the sun will rise tomorrow and uh, we're not going to escape this. So, you know, best you, you, um, you, you know, don't don't um, leave what you can do for today for tomorrow, because you never know what happens. You know, tomorrow might be a rain out day and, and, and that trench would be turned into mud. But if you had done it today, it would have been asphalt. So, you know, these little things like that. And um, and of course, the your your the main thing is your four P's, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the, the people, the purpose, the process and of course, the performance. Yeah. And uh, you know how that goes. And. And yeah, we we pretty much try to follow that that um, that uh, those four P's. It's, it's amazing how I think people in in this in business all kind of you know um, gravitate towards that that type of uh, uh, theory uh, and philosophy uh, to be successful. Well, Russell, I absolutely love what you said about the little things and the four P's and the not wasting time. And I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up hmm. your granddaughter Riley is my tennis protege what's the <laughs> biggest thing that impresses you most about her well you you know I'm biased obviously she's uh she's my she you know I had three sons right so we never had a daughter so she's like my the daughter I never had but uh, what impresses me is like well you know she's very diligent and she's very responsible she works hard you know so which makes her really coachable but you know I, I like that she's humble yeah so you know I, I watch her when she's playing matches and even if she wins she doesn't show any emotion you know she just okay tap tap the uh, rackets smile and you know walk off the court you know and then on and and when she loses she's same thing tap you know, tap racket, smile, and walk off the court. Of course, you know, when she's in the privacy of grandma's car, she's like, well, you know, I should have done this or whatever. But, you know, the whole point is that she's very even keeled. And I, I really, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know me, it's, it's all about character. And, yeah. and you're somebody, you're a man of great character. And I want to thank you for taking time to be on the show today and really share about why your businesses are successful. Well, thank you for having me. You know, um, if I might just say, you know, a, a couple of things, you know, um, you had asked, I, you know, I, I saw your questionnaire and, and it had to do with um, advice. What is the be best advice you've received? You know, and I, I and a lot, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, like Coach Amara, you know, of course, his was do your assignment. But in construction, my mentor was Sonny Okada. I, I'm not sure if you know who he is, but he was a very successful businessman back in the day. I mean, rough, really a roughneck guy. But he told me one day when I was uh, much, much younger, I was, this is, goes back in the 70s, and he said, hey, I want to tell you something. I, mean, you, I know at some point in your life, you're, gonna, you're probably going to start your own construction company. And he said, you know what? Lose face, save money. I said, yeah, I got it, Sonny. Yeah, you just got to, sometimes you've got to just put your ego away 
and 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 just get on with it and 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 you'd be better for it in the long run yeah i love that i love that thank you russell for joining me on the show today well thank you for having me again take care and thank you for watching beyond the lines on think tech hawaii for more information please visit rustykomori.com and my books are available on amazon and barnes and noble I hope that Russell and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.